Welcome to Ginghamsburg Church. I'm Pastor Rachel, and I've been praying for you, and I'm so glad you're here today. Today, we have a special guest. Pastor Mike Slaughter will be teaching from the book of Acts, chapter 12. Pastor Mike was the senior pastor here at Ginghamsburg Church for over 38 years, and it's so good to have him in the house. He's been a wonderful mentor to me and so many others. Today, he'll be helping us understand the importance of mentoring relationships and how you can take your next steps in faith with someone else. Let's begin worship today by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Pray with me. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Come on, Gingamsburg, we're gonna sing together this song. Sing it out with me. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Come on, sing it out.
Amen. God's love is overwhelming. Perhaps today is the day, the day that you're ready to say yes to Jesus. And if that's you, all you need to do is text yes to the number on the screen. That's yes with three S's. It's more like yes, because welcome to the family of God. I'm Pastor Rachel, and if you're still not sure about this whole Jesus thing, that's okay. Hang with us for a while. There's room at the table for everyone. If today is your very first time worshiping with us, could you let us know? Simply text NEW to the same exact number. And if you're with us on a regular basis, text CHECK IN. This number is the one you'll be using to keep in touch with our church family. It's just nice to know your name. No matter what happens with the pandemic or anything else in life might bring, uh, we're here for you. The church will never stop being the church. We can and will do incredible things together. Over the last two weekends, you donated 63 duffel bags full of donated supplies for foster families. That was enough to supply three different counties. So thank you. Thank you for being compassionate for foster kids within our reach. Next weekend is our monthly food drive. So come to the Tip City campus and drop to the drop-off zone between nine and noon next Sunday, or bring it with you at worship at Fort McKinley. Let's stock those shelves for our neighbors. Thank you for your generosity. The more you invest in the kingdom, the bigger God's table gets. Check out ginghamsburg.org give to learn how you can contribute to the move of God in Ginghamsburg Church today. Don't go anywhere. Grab your Bible, note-taking journal, and something to write with. The message is up next. It is so good to be back with you today and get to share with you in your home or places of uh, vacation that you may be uh, right now. And since the last time I have been with you, the world has radically changed. Who would have thought we would be in the midst of this global pandemic? So many questions. Uh, How we travel now. My wife and I just came back from North Carolina uh, and, and you're so careful about how you travel uh, on the interstate. Uh, most restaurants weren't open. It was drive through. Uh, so questions about the economy and everything else, it has affected us globally and it will never return to the way things were. I'm really excited about our study in the book of Acts because I see some spiritual parallels to this pandemic we're experiencing now. Jesus came to planet Earth to establish an infectious movement that would be spread through contagious people. This is what he said his last words before he left the planet. He said in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. That's the infectious agent, the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on people, they become possessed with the passionate love of Jesus that they want to share or mentor other people. Now, I want to ask you this question. I'm going to give you time. You may be sitting with a family or a friend. I want to ask you this question. Who was the contagious follower of Jesus who mentored you? Take a minute. I'm going to give you a moment to think about that, share that. First thought that comes to me is a a young man named Dwight who mentored me in college. He was the director of a campus ministry, and we had this Bible study uh, in his home on Tuesday evenings. He lived in an apartment. And so much of what I learned in that two years from Dwight, that I was with Dwight, became a model for mentoring uh, in my own life. Now, in the recovery community, we call these these mentors sponsors. And, And sponsors are mentor guides. And they're folks uh, who have been there, they have done it, uh, they have worked the program and they're experiencing sobriety, they're experiencing change. 
and they're helping less experienced mentorees uh, or protégés. And here's what, how it works. I'm going to read from 2 Timothy 2.2. We're talking about the Apostle Paul. Paul, now, who has been mentored, and we're going to get to that, by Barnabas, uh, is now mentoring. He's, he's reproducing this contagious uh, process with Timothy. Here's what he says. The things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, in trust of reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. That was Jesus' model. That was Jesus' plan. Now, when you think of Paul, who had been mentored by a man named Barnabas, the impact that Paul has had on the world, he's credited with written, writing 13 to 14 of the 27 books in the New Testament. So when you think about it, sisters and brothers, uh, no one has had more influence on the Christian movement uh, besides Jesus than, than uh, Paul. So let's get back to the person who mentored Paul. Now, Barnabas, when I read, I'm going to read in the 11th chapter of Acts, uh, starting in verse 22. The church heard that uh, the gospel had gotten out to Antioch, and Antioch is uh, in modern-day Turkey. So it says here, news of this reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas, we're going to learn uh, today that he's, he's the one who then will inf infect Paul. They, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad, and he encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Now listen to this part. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord through him. Now here comes this mentoring relationship. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Saul became Paul in his, his conversion. Uh, went to look for Saul to br bring him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas mentored Saul and met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Now, when we look at the characteristics of a mentor, here, here's what we see. In Barnabas, we see credibility. He was known for his character. His character lacked duplicity. And, and it's the same kind of character we see in Jesus. Jesus said in, in the Gospel of John, I have set you an example by the way he lived so that you also should do just as I have done for you. So we see Barnabas repeats this character of credibility, and Paul will too. Paul said to the Corinthians, do as I do, for I am doing as Christ did. He's not do, saying, do as I say. He's saying, live as I live. Now, the second characteristic we see in this mentor, Barnabas, is experience. He had been there and done that. Right now in my own personal life, I'm mentoring next generation young pastors through my ministry, Passionate Churches, LLC. And I'm focusing exclusively on pastors. Well, why? That's my experience. I just finished the 1st of June, 48 years in active ministry, but 45 of those years were in the local church. Now, the next ca uh, characteristic we see in Barnabas is, is faith. How is he recognized? Uh, a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Man, he was on fire with the Holy Spirit. He acted in the power of the Holy Spirit and was directed by the mandate of the Holy Spirit, not his feelings or what he could see with his eyes. And here's a very important fourth characteristic, grace. Mentors believe in do-overs. All of us fall down, sisters and brothers. And in the ninth chapter, I love it, when Saul had this conversion and became Paul, he tried to get active in the church in Jerusalem, but they were keeping him out. 
And, and we can read how Barnabas believed in Paul in spite of his uh, failures in persecuting the church and stood for him and brought him into full fellowship in the life of the Christian community in, in Jerusalem. Now, I, right now, you know, we all should have mentors in our life and be mentors to someone else. I have a mentor right now. His name is Paul, Paul Stuckey. And Paul, I know you're watching right now. I'm going to be 69 next month, and Paul is almost a quarter of, of a century older than I am uh, in his 90s. And what Paul's teaching me, we just communicated last night, uh, Paul is teaching me how to grow old in grace, uh, in joy, in love, and in fun. Paul, I saw you out on Lake St. Mary's in your boat uh, last week, and, and you and Peg uh, have, oh man, I can't believe all the places you go out to eat and send pictures of where you are. You winter in your condo in Florida, uh, and then, then you come back uh, home here to the Dayton, Ohio area. And Paul, I just want to thank you so much for how you're teaching me uh, to grow old in the power of the Holy Spirit and joy. Well, every mentor needs a protege. A protege. Um, we know very little about Barnabas. Like I said, there's, there's only about five mentions of Barnabas uh, in the New Testament. We know a whole lot about Paul. But do you know where the success of Barnabas lies? The fruit of Barnabas' life hangs on Paul's trees. Success doesn't come by the recognition we receive or even personal achievement. Success comes by the fruit of our lives that will live on in the lives of other people. In 2008, uh, my friend, Pastor uh, Adam Hamilton and I, discovered that uh, across the Methodist church, less than 5% of pastors were 35 or under. And that in the next... 10 years from 2008 to 2018, 60% of Methodist pastors would retire. I was in that group when I went out in, in 2017. So we started something called Young Pastors Network to identify high-profile, uh, competent young pastors uh, across the United States. Well, you know, how how we prayerfully, uh, prayerfully select and choose, which is critical when we're, we're talking about choosing mentorees, is we ask bishops across the country to identify high-capacity young, young leaders. And we started with a class of 50. Well, Pastor Rachel was one of those top 50 young pastors uh, in America. This past week, uh, Pastor Rachel... Uh, got three others of those young pastors to talk about mentoring in their own life. Watch this video. Friends, uh, I'm so delighted that you have joined us today. I'm in a conversation with some of my favorite people um, who are coming uh, to us from throughout the country. Jacob Armstrong is the pastor at Providence Church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. Uh, Matt Miofsky is the pastor at The Gathering in St. Louis, Missouri. And Nick Cunningham, our beloved Nick, who uh, spent so many years with us here at Ginghamsburg, has yeah. launched a new church, um, the uh, Emmaus Church in Columbia, South Carolina. And so um, I just want to get started with a simple question. Friends, who mentored you uh, in the first place? Like, who was that first mentor that had a really incredible impact on your life? First of all, Ginghamsburg, I miss you all, you rock. Um, Man, early on, I had a, uh, a good friend of mine, his dad. His dad was uh, one of the first ones, I think, maybe to recognize um, things in me that I certainly hadn't really seen in myself. I was, uh, I mean, I, I played sports. I knew myself as a jock, as an athlete, and he, he wouldn't let me just fall back into that that sort of role that I, you know, would tend to play in group settings. He was the first one to really kind of push me um, like into leadership roles. One of my earliest uh, mentors really was my childhood pastor. 
And then when I was 14, he, you know, he asked me to preach and kind of taught me how to write a sermon and, and offer a word. And it was a small church, but they saw in me things that I couldn't see in myself. Uh, my sophomore year in college, became an intern at a church under uh, this guy named Gary, who was the missions pastor and the student pastor. And just for a number of years, I just was his assistant. It's crazy how many things that are a part of like my ministry now and the church that we helped start that are just like his DNA. Okay, so we're talking a little bit about Mike Slaughter today. He's preaching a great sermon. And uh, how has Mike's mentorship really impacted your ministry? The thing that he did for me over, you know, uh, well over a decade now is just uh, never let me go, you know, yeah. like he just always engaged me, but also loved me, you know, and like knows my wife's name yeah. and asked about her. And um, unbelievably, he's just engaged me in my life and ministry over and over and over so that there is that kind of immediate connection when he calls and we can just go go right to it what kind of spouse I am and what kind of father I am. Those are the two things that Mike probably asks me. And we talk about that more than we talk about techniques or ministry or leadership or anything like that. Man, I mean, so much of who I am, uh, what I say, I mean, that was, that was like one of the irritating things when I, you know, I, and I eventually left uh, Gingersburg is when I would hear myself say the things that he said all the time. And it was like, you know, when I was there and he would say it, you'd roll your eyes because you've heard it so many times. You know, you're just like, oh, here we go again. But then you find yourself in a new context and you and you find yourself saying those things, not just saying, but believing them. And then I think is so needed right now, still more than ever, is his commitment to say and do the right thing, like, especially when it's the hard thing. Yeah. You know, like, uh, he never shies away from that. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times as a student pastor there, I had to go and recruit a bunch of new volunteers because he ticked them all off and they all left. <laughs> You know, so it's like, <laughs> all right, here we go. but but it was yeah. just watching him time after time in these moments where a lot of people would shrink back because they were afraid of who they would offend, um, who they would lose, what it would cost them. He would just go right into that, you know, and and I think we're all better for it. When I was a senior pastor in Sh uh, at Shiloh in Cincinnati, he invited myself and my leadership board chair to be part of the leadership board retreats here. Like, I mean, nothing was off limits. He just kept pulling me in and pouring into me. And frankly, mm. I, I mean, in some ways I was a nobody. And yet he just said, it doesn't matter. I, I see something in you and I'm gonna give you everything that I've got. I mean, we're some of the most poured into um, relatively young <laughs> pastors in the country. What are we doing with that? How are you paying uh, that kind of gift forward? I've told myself this a lot is like, you know, when, when I am in that place and I, I recognize this younger leader, you know, who, who has influence and who is gifted or whatever, I'm going to fight my fight really hard this feeling of like not being threatened by them. I think, I think a lot of times when you get established in leadership, you can see where when someone else comes along, how easy it is to be threatened by them, you know, and it was really, it was really powerful to watch him sort of resist that and uh, take risks on, on a lot of us, you know. I, I try to be open to, to the fact that God might raise up unlikely people that he wants me to invest time in. I think I was an unlikely person yeah. for certain people to make space for. And so not just to look for kind of the predictable uh, mentees, but the, the surprises that God might bring into your life for a particular purpose and you need to be open, open to that. We have this responsibility and this honor of being pastors in influential places, and our voices really do matter. Um, but they don't matter just so that we can have a platform. They matter so that we can like share all of that resource with someone else. And uh, I certainly want to see a whole new generation of people who answer a call, um, and whether that call looks like vocational ministry or not, um, they're just set on fire through the power of the Holy Spirit to change the world. Thanks, yeah. Rachel. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel. So we see the, the power of mentoring. All of us need a mentor, and all of us need mentorees who we can guide to the next level. Now, here comes the third part, separation. We don't stay with these uh, protégés forever, sisters and brothers. This comes a time where 
we separate. And even though it's painful, you know, every, I, as a pastor, I see every time one of our folks leaves Ginghamsburg Church uh, to go out, it means multiplication. And, and there's been so many examples. Mike Berry, when he left Ginghamsburg, I love Mike, and, and he went out to restart Medway Church out of here. And before this virus, they were averaging close to 1,300 people. Uh, Tony Miltenberger, who's in the Centerville area uh, here in Dayton, is doing a great ministry. Chris Freeman went off to northern Indiana. We feel pain every time these people leave, and he's planted a church and is doing well. Nick Cunningham in South Carolina has started uh, Emmaus Church, and they're doing exciting ministry. Uh, Roz Picardo, who left here uh, as we planted a uh, mosaic church south of uh, the area where we are. John Morgan, who just recently left. Jimmy Jones. Now, so you had to be around here a long time. He left in like 1995, but he planted a church. Uh, and before this uh, virus situation, they were over a thousand active people in that that movie. A movement. And sometimes this happens in disagreement, painful dis disagreement. We read this in the 15th chapter, 39th verse, that Barnabas and Paul had such a sharp disagreement, they parted company. Ah, my sister is really into cats. I'm not so excited about cats. Um, and she gets on me anytime I say something negative. But she um, uh, rescues cats, she feeds dumpster cats, she catches cats and has, has them neutered. So one time uh, she took me with her to this dumpster area in her condo complex to feed cats uh, one night. And it's amazing, they, they know her. They come out of, it's in a wooded area, they come out of the woods and so forth and uh, eat, run back into the woods. So. They ran back into to the woods, and all of a sudden, I hear the terrible screeching. And I, and, and I said to my sister, oh, my gosh, they're fighting. They'll kill each other. And my sister looked at me and, and smiled. She said, Michael, they're not fighting. They're reproducing. Well, there's a lesson to learn here is that God uses uh, this fight between Barnabas and Paul it, it wasn't really fighting. It was reproducing. It was multiplying. Well, sisters and brothers, we have all been called to this, this process to have guides and then to be mentor guides. Now, there's three questions that are going to appear uh, on, on the screen, and I want you to work through those three questions. Can you identify a positive mentoring relationship in your life and what made it good? Have you had a negative mentoring relationship in your life and what made it bad? And who have you invited into a mentoring relationship or who will you? God bless you all. I'll be praying for you. Please pray for me. Thank you, Pastor Mike, and thank you for joining us today. Next Sunday, I invite you to explore what it means to know Jesus and to live the Jesus life at Ginghamsburg. First up is a four session core class that is perfect for anyone new to faith or new to Ginghamsburg Church. You can either attend in person or online. It all starts at 11 a.m. next Sunday. Find the registration form on the Ginghamsburg app under the featured events. Again, thanks for your generosity today. With God, all things are possible. Now go and find a mentor. See you next week. Okay, so we're talking a little bit about Mike Slaughter today. He's preaching a great sermon. And uh, how has Mike's mentorship really impacted your ministry? Who's Mike? <laughs> yes! <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Jacob. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah. I was like, every inappropriate joke that I know, I learned from Mike. That's, <laughs> that's definitely true. Uh, he's corrupted me in all the right ways. Well, friends, it has been delightful to be in this conversation uh, with the three of you. And I know every single moment of this is going to be a gift to Ginghamsburg. 
um, and a gift to our movement. So I just have to say thank you. And uh, we're certainly praying for you and your ministry um, that God just multiplies in ways, even in this COVID season that you could never ask or imagine. And uh, certainly uh, I covet those same prayers from you. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Rachel. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel. All right. End. <laughs>